Dzień dobry Państwu. Weronika Gawińska Bruliki. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Jana Kurtyka Foundation. It's my honor to invite you to a meeting, being part of the uh, project Seeds of Peace. Today we're going to discuss Generals Sosabowski and Maciek, the heroic commanders of the Polish Armed Forces in the West. May I welcome our guests today, Mr. Wojciech Marke, the historian and museum expert, a graduate of the University of Warsaw Institute of History, expert in Polish military formations, 1918-1947. He brings together his passion and professional work he works and produces academic uh, papers, but also academic tourism. He worked for the Military Institute for Historical Research. He was involved in the development of the Józef Piłsudski Museum in Sulejówek. Currently, he works for the Solidarity Institute, named after Witold Pilecki, an aficionado of books. He is interested in the history of Warsaw and the northwestern uh, marshes of the former Poland. Dr. Damian Dębowski, Deputy President of Janusz Kurtyka Foundation and the moderator. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome. The project of the Rally Race of Generations is funded from the funds of the a president of the Chancellery of Ministers. The media partner of the project are Blog Press and British Post. May I now invite Dr. Damian Bębnowski to take the floor. He is the Deputy President of Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to meet you again with and among so many events organized by the Janusz Kortyka Foundation in Warsaw. The flagship and the main purpose of our organization is to promote the achievements of Polish history in the world and also promotion of the historical knowledge on Poland, on our history, on the phenomenon of Polishness, which played such an important role in the history of the entire world, not only of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the projects, as it has been mentioned a moment ago, of the projects that are coordinated by the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation is the one entitled Seeds of History. It is an international project that we have already run for three years now, as and there have been successful editions of it. This is a project that lets us coordinate cooperation with Polonia organizations in various corners of the world. We also network with the Polonia organizations in such countries as the US, the UK, Germany, Austria, and Canada. And we have successfully established cooperation in this field with more than 20 organizations of the Polonia that we invite to cooperate as part of this project in the fields in which we have expertise. We cooperate with organizations of the Polonia, of the Polish diaspora, in distribution of books on history, the best books on history, published by our Polish historians, which we award reward in Janusz Kurtyka competition, and the prize is translation and publication of the best historical works in the West in cooperation with recognized and prestigious publishing houses, academic publishing houses in the West. An additional prize is the organization for our winners, historians, 
promotional meetings, including also those that belong to the Seeds of History project. Thus, we perceive and we emphasize the subjectivity of our partners, the subjectivity of the organizations of the Polonia, which in this world way, even when before, feel perceived and appreciated, as well as included in the process that is so very useful and necessary today, the process of promoting the most beautiful elements of our Polishness. For very often, the contribution of those Polonia organizations so powerfully involved in the respective countries into the reinforcement of Polishness remains badly uh, underappreciated. Therefore, we are very keen to have those contacts with the Polonia maintained also at the level of the third sector that is of the NGOs, such as ours. As part of this project, we also organize meetings with the invited experts, with the invited historians, and they are not only the winners of our competition. Many of them are highly appreciated researchers, like, for example, our guest today. I'd like to thank him very warmly, as our cooperation has now lasted for years. The more glad am I that we can meet again today as part of Seeds of History project. The Foundation has also organized multiple conferences during which representatives of various organizations of the Polonia had an opportunity to share their experience in the field of what we call, somewhat metaphorically perhaps, what we call being the ambassadors of Polishness and of the good name of the Republic worldwide. Following upon that particular role played by the organizations of the Polonia, we also organize a competition for the past future prize, where we appreciate different bodies, institutions, organizations in different uh, categories, and also individuals who are involved in commemoration of Polish history, reinforcing it. As part of it, we got a separate category, Polonia and Poles Abroad, which we want to use to honor those activists of the Polonia whose activity, I would say, deserves particular Com command and praise. We have also managed to start a subsite on our website about events in Polish history. These have been translated into English and German. One of the authors of those articles was Mr. Marker, whom we host today. We have also created an interactive database on the Polish cathedrals. It operates at American universities. Therefore, this project, the Seeds of History, financed by the Polish state from the budget of the Chancellery of the Prime Minister, is extensive, international, and it has many aspects. What the future of the project is going to be, time will show. With the new circumstances, everything now depends on the new hosts of the building in Aleja Ujazdowskie in Warsaw. I wish you a very good time, and now may I pass the microphone to our guest, Mr. Wojciech Marker. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I wanted to thank very cordially for the invitation and for this opportunity of telling you about the things that are not only my research interests, but also my hobby, my passion, something that I have dealt with for over two decades. And I have that luck that I can speak of the things that at the same time are my work and an element of my life, so this sheer pleasure. Nevertheless, this history is often dramatic. There are more things there than just all the pleasantries and pleasant moments. Today, however, I will have this opportunity to discuss with you fantastic figures in the history of Poland. May I now start from this slightly witty uh, comment that the three great commanders of Polish forces in the West were born in the same year, 1892. I wouldn't, of course, make any numerological conclusions, but I believe it's not really a coincidence. That was a very particular generation, and perhaps it's worthwhile to note that as much as in 1939, most of the top uh, commanders did not really prove their mettle in uh, commanding the army. I'd like to make a short digression that it is so that those who remember the previous war, won the previous war, and they don't always work in the following one. It's not only a Polish problem, and the, this happens all around the world. We've got General Sabowski, General Maciek, there was also Anders. In '39, they were medium and lower ranking officers, and most of them passed the test. That was a whole generation. They are perhaps the best known, perhaps the most colorful representatives of a particular generation in Polish army, unfortunately horribly decimated in Cutting, Starobelsk and other places in the east. Many of them were taken prisoners of war in 39 and then were murdered. Yet, following this case, I'd keep under somewhat aside but following the bios of generals Maciek, Sosabowski and Anders, you can truly follow the story of Polish armed forces in the West because their histories dovetail and in a way they together let you tell the whole story of that military formation. That is why I suggest that I start from presenting first the figure of General Sosabowski, then Maciek, and then I tell you a bit about what you perhaps won't find in the books and articles, but rather this synthetic insight and what I find most important, an attempt at assessing. We very often are afraid to confront them, to compare their contribution to what their colleagues from other armies did with the achievements of others. So perhaps first it's worthwhile to show these figures, and then I'll try to compare them, their fates, to a degree. Let me start, sorry, with General Sosabowski. Ladies and gentlemen, it's impossible in such a short time to share the whole biography of any of these figures, but just sharing the biography could take the whole day because they are fascinating figures with very interesting character traits. But I'll try to give you just the general outline. Stanisław Sosabowski came from a worker's family. 
family. He was born and brought up in Stanisławów, and he was very young when he got involved in that self-help of students, which took him to the underground. At that time, it was quite common. Boys would begin with their education and then they would get further involved. Let us remember about the period of history we are talking about. Partitions, certain things were not meant to be discussed. Some kind of conspiracy begins at the level of various clubs. Then you have rifleman organizations. This is his story too. Now, in his case, what was quite interesting is that his father died quite early. He died in an accident and his family was suffering from terrible poverty. So, Sosabowski was tutoring and that was one of the ways in which he could help his family. So, because of that poverty that he experienced, he became very hardened and stubborn. It is something that you can see in his recollections, his own and those of the people that had known him. When he was young, he was a very, a very poor constitution. He would be a sickly child and sports for him was a path to overcome that. And that is when his mental strength was developed. He was able to learn how to strive at all costs to obtain his objective. Now, he did not make it to the Polish legions. Similarly, Maciek never got that. He was quite seriously wounded in World War I. I believe it was 1915, and he would remain in non-front roles throughout the remaining years, and that was where he learned a lot. Later, you would see that he was quite scrupulous, quite stubborn, but also he was able to organize things very well, thanks to his experience in World War I. Here he is with his sons. One of his sons died in tragic circumstances. Already here you see how attached he was to sports. He served at the Polish military. This is this period. So what kind of a figure are we talking about? Quite a controversial one. His character was difficult to deal with and it showed already in the interim period, but he was a very good organizer indeed. He was quite skilled and those skills were quite precious in the Polish military as it was being reconstituted after 1917, he demanded that he be sent to the front line, but it never happened. He was captain headquarters. He would obtain armaments from France. So basically he acted effectively as a quartermaster. He was responsible for sourcing and his work was deemed to be as important as frontline work. And at the end of the war, he was awarded with the same salary and lead allotment as if he had actually participated in battles. 
And that goes to show how important his work was. In the interim period, interwar period rather, he taught and served in various units. 21st um, Battalion of the Children of Warsaw, this is what he took command of. And in 30, 1939, basically it was a part of the 8th Division. It was supposed to fight in northern Mazovia before it engaged, it got dispersed, it had to withdraw. And his unit, the one led by Sosabowski, remained a single entity. Furthermore, they would collect bits and pieces from all the units that got dispersed. In mid-September, he led this group to Warsaw and he would defend Warsaw until the city surrendered. It was close to Grochow, I believe. And Germans never gained much land where he commanded. Mind you, he had very good people under his command. And then the city surrendered. And this is when he chose not to fully follow the orders, even though he was very much a disciplinarian. So some of the arms were not given up, but hidden. They were already then thinking about conspiracy. Him and his soldiers were thinking ahead. They had no intention to surrender. This defeat of 1939 was a tragedy. But by no means was it the end of it all. Those were the people that were fighting for Polish independence. They knew that you had to fight on. He decided to surrender as he was ordered. Interestingly enough, he did it with his son, who by then was also an officer, and he also was stationed in Warsaw. So, they were taken prisoners, but two days later, they changed their minds. I believe that it was in Sohachev when they decided to escape, and they did it both without any major difficulty. Sosobowski became involved in conspiracy work. He was sent first to Lwów, then to Hungary, and from there on to France. Now, it was in France that his organizing skills became to shine. He organized an infantry unit. Unfortunately, this work was never fully done. This division never participated in the fight as it was constituted, they evacuated, or rather he evacuated to the UK, where he formed more units. Now the command would be taken by somebody else, by a designated officer. But it would happen once Sosobowski would have done his job. When that happened for the third or possibly fourth time, when he was forming a division, this was a Canadian rifleman unit, because at first these were supposed to be Canadian volunteers. There was this idea to send somebody else, and this is when he rebelled. He demanded that he gets command. And that is what happened. That particular plan never succeeded. The unit never was sent to Canada. The fourth the rifleman, the rifleman's unit, this was the name that was given, and they ended up in Scotland. There's many other Polish units.
in the period. Now, the immediate threat of German invasion was over in 1940, and that is when the service became quite difficult for him because it became boring. It was difficult to retain discipline. It was, you know, basically almost like herding cats. So, so Sabowski was trying to find another thing to do. That coincided with what the commander-in-chief was striving towards, namely with organizing communication back in the country. Aerial units were meant to be formed, parachuters, among other things. Now, the main one was supposed to be this first rifleman brigade. It was already formed, but the results were not terribly promising. However, there was this Sosabowski unit too, that turned out was quite promising. He would try to send his people to all possible courses, special forces training, survival courses, parachuting courses. He was doing all he could to keep those people busy so that they wouldn't be losing time. At the same time, he was trying to keep this unit as operational as possible. And that coincided with his love for sports. He was able to pass it on to his people. He was able to gather around him the kind of people that would actually feel that passion of his. A few of the officers that joined him were people that he had known back from Poland from another unit, an infantry unit. So the results that he achieved was quite, were quite amazing, especially when you compare them to what theoretically superior units had to show for themselves. And ultimately it was Sosabowski that was asked to take care of this parachutist unit. It would take a long time to form it and to train it. It was meant to support a general uprising in Poland. Akcja Burza was the name of this particular planned campaign. And the Englishmen were quite impressed with what the Polish para troopers had to show. There was this idea to merge his people with the British forces. So Sabowski would keep refusing because he kept in his mind that this brigade was meant to operate in Poland. The Allied forces wanted to involve his unit in the Western Front. First, they believed that it would be necessary. They were building, basically, an army to invade Europe, and they needed such paratroopers' forces for the activities in Normandy. This Polish brigade if it had landed in Poland, you would have an awkward political situation. After all, it was the Red Army that was entering the Polish lands, and the English wanted to avoid such political difficulties. This is at least what the research has been suggesting recently. Sosabowski would be quite adamant that his people be sent to Poland when it was revealed that it's impossible. He wanted them to be simply ready, and he opposed any strange and risky ideas because the English would come up with some strange concepts. Market Garden was the operation that they finally were, were deployed it 
in and basically it was a very weird thing that they did there this operation was poorly planned and poorly executed so sabowski in all that was quite constructive in what his in what he was doing when they landed he would try to sell solve this operation even though the english really hated the fact that he was criticizing market garden once he became its part he reduced so solutions for salvaging the people for saving the operation the english rejected it and then they decided to blame him for the failure the british activity resulted in calling general off from his position of a major general they were also had the cheek that in the exchange of letters it was downing the leader of the uh, british uh, forces in montgomery said that the polish soldiers were cowardly that they didn't want to fight and general Sosabowski kept piling problems that he was unfit for command. Some of those documents were only opened in the 1980s. Even the British knew that that was exaggerated. Nevertheless, the whole atmosphere developed around General Sosabowski and his soldiers made them treated marginally for decades in literature or in the beginning, they simply disappeared in the film shot immediately after the war in Arnhem with participation of the veterans from the division. Not very well known that film was. There, there is glory. It doesn't even mention the Poles who fought with great devotion and the veterans themselves admitted that that was not fair. So this was a really tragic solution because on the one hand those soldiers could not return to Poland after the war because of the repressions they were afraid of the repressions so Sabowski chose the life of a political exile he never received British society so he was a stateless he was not stripped of his Polish citizenship. However, he himself believed that he cannot, during communism, return to Poland. He tried to maintain touch with Poland and Poland, but he didn't want to legitimize the communist regime. And he was landed without a salary. All he could do was to serve in the military, serve in the army. Well, he only began to learn his English very late, so he didn't have any greater achievements in this field, and he found it very hard to uh, find employment. He was a blue-collar worker, he was a warehouse manager, he didn't have his retirement pension, he lived in quite dire straits, and he was really humiliated by the British. They built around him this bad atmosphere, that bad air. Well, Poles, of course, his Polish soldiers approached this differently, but the position of Poles at the time was very poor. This was also something that the Dutch subscribed to, and the Dutch for a long time had remorse that they yielded to the British 
in that narrative that they didn't honor him. They said good things about Sosabowski, but they didn't protest against the British lies. And for that reason, they had that remorse. General Sosabowski was really a difficult personality. Some elements of what the British mentioned could have been true. He was stubborn, hard to negotiate, but he was highly responsible. And what he was accused of was an absolute and utter lie. To a certain extent, the Dutch after his death, decided to rectify it. They wanted to have him rehabilitated. Although Sosabowski was never accused directly or demoted, but they had the sense of somehow rewarding him for that. The British refused to acknowledge their guilt and the Dutch made an absolute exception. They gave Sosabowski a posthumous order, military order that is never given outside the military conditions. So that was an absolute exception. They felt that they had to react somehow to the circumstances. And this happened so that the Dutch behaved properly. They also tried to make the British follow suit. I also participated in that. However, that effort has brought no result as yet. But speaking of that injustice that uh, Sosabowski met, with made the British veterans speak out. And these are the British veterans who resulted in unveiling this little monument where the Polish brigade fought. They financed this little monument. And I believe that this is the first step to have the British, with the passage of time, one day taking some step here, making a gesture. May I also address the film the, made by Jana Pichukiewicz. I helped a bit about around it, and it speaks of that great harm, mostly about General Sosabowski, but about that great harm into whose way he was drawn. I'll move to the other hero, but let me just finish that General Sosabowski died and he never lived to see his Dutch rehabilitation, but he was finally uh, buried in Warsaw. He believed that most Poles live by the Vistula and that this is where he should return to. In his lifetime, he had the veterans gather various mementos connected to the uh, paratrooper brigade and they took it to the museum in Warsaw. He gave away all his uh, uniforms, all his medals. He believed this is where they should be and he knew that Poland one day will regain independence. That happened and he hoped for these things to be presented now. This um, uniform is not being exhibited as the museum is being transformed, but it was for many years. Returning to the film, it was originally to be titled The Honor of the Generals, and it's partially my fault that the title changed because I simply explained to Joanna that one film for two generals is too little. General Matek is still waiting. I started talking about two generals and she was uh, inspired enough to create a film about General Sosabowski. She knows this story and she really feels it. General Maciek would be really a worthy person and 
Super. Eee, proszę Państwa, no, może nie bliźnie, well, ale trochę podobne życiorys. Trochę. Maybe not a twin, but the life story is somewhat similar. Somewhat. Mieszkający w zaborze austro-węgierskim. Living in the Austro-Hungarian partition, there he was brought up near Lviv. Sosabowski was from a poor worker family. Now Matryk came from a family of um, civil servants. He had his Croatian roots. He also went through the austro Hungarian service, Austro-Hungarian army, and like Sosabowski, he learned the something that was really valuable. Namely, he at a certain time was the commander of a skiers um, troop, and he organized those raids, and these were not really typical ways of running combat. This was the tactic of those quick units, special units. There he gained his first experience and he developed it during the Polish Bolshevik and Polish Ukrainian war. Now there is this world hit that Blitzkrieg, that's the doctrine that is believed to be German, and it's Germans who brought that into battle. However, such things had happened much earlier, but in the 20th century, such a blitzkrieg also by armed forces happened also in Poland. For example, the attack, the, the armed attack on Zhytomir, which broke the line of the front, was an action of the type that Matek uh, run. He was the commander of a company or a battalion or a squadron. He led infantry, for example, in cavalry units. Uh, infantry could move much faster, for example, on horse-drawn uh, carts, and they could make quick raids behind the enemy's lines and cause a breakthrough, a dynamic shift, and his troops of cavalry uh, had moved, diff moved along different routes. Now, into those horse-drawn carts, you could take your heavy machine guns, more ammunition, sometimes also a mortar. So at the time, he really used the tactic of the future armored and motorized brigades. This is where he was gaining his experience. Well, the way of thinking didn't change. These were only the vehicles that did. The way of thinking about the, their use was similar. He gained recognition with those activities. He too, between the two world wars, uh, commanded various units and also graduated uh, this higher military academy. Now, he also studied humanities in Lvov. He was a philosopher and a linguist by training. He studied Polish, which is not a typical path for a serviceman. But he was a person who was very well educated indeed. All of that led him to being selected as the commander of the first fully motorized brigade in the history of Poland. Well, we had had, as Poland, some minor units of this type, but the 10th cavalry brigade 
got equipped with motorized equipment. It was the first step to motorize the whole Polish army. It is untrue, by the way, that the Polish army was outdated and that we basically chose to fight on horses. What we didn't have was time and money. We were simply too poor to go through with all these reforms on time. So he was a very good candidate for such a pioneer. This is Maciek as a colonel who commanded that unit. It was the Olja 1938. I do not want to go into the politics of that campaign. It is at this point believe that it was a major mistake on the polish part however in terms of the military craft it was carried out very well indeed and colonel maciek's unit played a very important role there 1939 a beautiful chapter a brigade was fighting in podkarpacie and they hampered the German progress significantly there. But holistically, the situation was what it was. Maciek had to lose ground and he was losing his equipment. He didn't have enough fuel. He couldn't actually use well-maintained roads. So they've lost a lot of equipment. This brigade, however, was the only one which crossed the Hungarian border as a, roughly speaking, single entity. So I do not mean just the people, but also the equipment. From there, Maciek proceeded to go to France. That is where he was tasked with the recreation of his unit and that unit fought in France. But basically, he had to retreat similarly to what happened in Poland. It was an encore, if you will. They had to abandon their equipment and disband the unit. The soldiers never gave up and they would make their way to the UK. Maciek got promoted um, and he moved to Marseille. And then he would even got to Northern Africa dressed as an Arab. And yet again, he would be tasked with organizing this 10th Cavalry Brigade. And then it was turned into the 1st Armored Division. This is his chief of staff. Maciszek Stibinski, his longtime friend, he would write about that division extensively about all these events, about um, the unit itself. You could give it a caption, Ranek, let's give it another try. So, this was the first unit that became operational. I'm talking about the Polish land forces in the West. I'm not talking about um, and air units. Now, in 1944, they landed in France, it was in August, they fought in the Falaise pocket. Basically, they closed this gap there. They worked on the encirclement. The forces that were closed in this cauldron uh, played a very important role because basically, as a result, Germans would only try to slow down the Allied's progress. This is all they could do at the time. The Allied were stopped not so much the Germans, but rather the logistical issues on the part of the Allies. They had some issues 
with the ammo and fuel. The harbors basically didn't have a sufficient throughput to make it all happen sufficiently fast. However, there was some fighting. There was fighting indeed, but the thing is, they had to be quite dynamic about it so that the Germans wouldn't be able to get themselves together, pull themselves together and organize resistance. There was a question though. These regions were highly urbanized, many human settlements, and there was this desire not to risk civilian lives, so the goal was to enter a given town or village as soon as they could, but also to avoid urban fighting, if possible again. So there was this tactical and strategic operational uh, sense on the part of Machex. He was able to form the right combat groups, and he would do it in a skillful way, he would send them so that they would chase the Germans. As a result of his skill, the losses would be quite minimal. And that is something that the Belgians and the Dutch really loved about him. I'm not saying, though, that there was no fighting. People would die. The Polish troops would die. Germans did resist, but that resistance would be broken. Until came the autumn and the Allied stopped. Maczek saw that his division was weakened in due to his fighting in France, so he didn't want his people to participate in the fights in Windsor. To some extent, they did anyway. So basically, they found themselves in a Canadian army, effectively, and the Canadians did enter the fray again in spring when the main offensive started. Two episodes is what I would like to discuss here. There was this um, camp in Oberlangen. They liberated th that and revealed its Hafen, a huge Polish success. So quite a finale. Now, why am I showing this map? Because I wanted to show you the scale of things, how long this route was. And mind you, it took them less than a year to cover all this distance while fighting. Now, what happened after the war? The first division was basically tantamount with Maczek, and for a good reason. Maczek was promoted, became the commander of the corps, but then his unit and Sosobowski's unit, no longer commanded by, by him, found themselves in Germany as occupying forces. That is when Poles would give Polish names to German towns, Maczkowa, Spadochronowa, Lwów. So these are names that basically are Polish in nature. Now, Maczek's situation was a bit better than his colleagues, that is, Sosabowski. He did not suffer. As much, nobody tried to undermine his achievements the way it was the case with Sosobowski's work. However, in terms of how he heard in life, it was very much similar. He was not a professional soldier. He didn't have a pension. It was difficult for him to to do uh, well financially, so he worked as a bartender for years. I remember 
what his people would say. Yes, they would meet him, and it was great that they would meet him, but it was a little bit embarrassing and humiliating because their own superior would serve them as a bartender. It, it is not, it was not the right thing. He was buried in Rita at a military hospital. In 2020, they opened a mausoleum. It's a town in the Netherlands where his name is quite cherished. And yes, there are many other villages and towns where they remember about him, but his memory is truly cherished there. There is this memorial created jointly by the Dutch and by the Polish. There is a museum slash memorial center there. Now, I would like to add something to what I've said. Let's look at them. Let's try to assess who they were, what they achieved. These were generals who would be very stubborn, persistent in their fight against the Germans. Remember, Poland lost their defensive campaign, but those people wouldn't give up. Look at how those fates were intertwined in their manner of speaking. So Sabowski would conspire, Maczek would cross the border with his troops. And on top of that, you need to remember about Anders, who would become a Soviet POW, he would be imprisoned. Fortunately, he was not killed in cutting. But the thing is that, you know, they play different roles. Those people continued their struggle, continued their fight, and they decided to act and give their craft to another army effectively. Effectively, it was the Allies that benefited from that. So here we have two generals. They were not the kind of people that would have to learn from the British or French colleagues. Quite the opposite, they could teach. Yet, and the thing is, our allies did not want to learn from us. That's a separate thing. Our commanders had very rich experience. They were well educated. They were also quite skilled. The military craft was very good indeed. Sosabowski could not show his military skill, at least not the way he might have. It was largely due to what was happening there. I'm talking about the market garden operation. I don't want to dwell on that because it would take at least an hour to do that. But he could show how good an organizer he was, how good a trainer he was when he had been preparing this brigade for years and the British would, you know, take a peek and learn from him. He was also, Sosabowski that is, able to use the skills of his people. He trained people, he trained paratroopers, and basically the British called it the Polish method. 
The Polish method, the losses in the trained personnel were far smaller. Also, the use of the paratroopers was far better developed, far better uh, thought through, and this particular character of those troops was understood far better, the challenges related to their use and also the opportunities that using those offered. Polish officers understood that much better than the British officers. There are documents that can only now be used. They were not made secret, they were hidden, they were, you know, difficult to, to obtain access to. Now the Brits also begin to speak about this. They show that while the British officers of the staff thought about creating a battalion and thinking whether perhaps several hundred of people could be too many, maybe only about a hundred, maybe these would be the ideal units. There are reports, there are suggestions and also attempts at implementing such projects of a whole uh, airborne corps with numbers of soldiers counted in thousands, tens of thousands. Obviously, there were some limitations caused by us being fully dependent in matters of equipment and the training facilities on our allies, but just the very way of thinking was at an entirely different level. Of course, Poles were, had the upper hand here. This situation was similar with Maciek. Maybe he did not stand out very much when it comes to comparison with the American uh, commanders. I don't want to compare to Patton because this was a different level. But it's a bit of that. Poles were more delicate, more um, paying more attention to the losses to civilians, to own soldiers. That was very particular about the Polish army, that they cared about the soldiers. I'm not saying that the Western allies did not care at all. They were not the Red Army, were they? But they had a far greater range of options. In our case, those soldiers who emigrated, everyone was everyone lost was irreplaceable. So you cared for everyone so as to lose as few as possible during training. And so you wanted to lose the fewest men in training and then in combat. So the skills of the commanders and the way they accepted the tasks or not, and the way they carried them out, this was of key importance for the actual losses incurred by those units. And let's now return to it. The Sosabowski had his options strongly limited. He was pushed into an operation that was falling apart when most of the Poles landed at Arnhem, they could really not change much, but they were loyal in fighting hand in hand with their allies, although they didn't agree with them about different things, although they question the properness, but it's ne it never happened in the whole history of the Polish armed forces in the West, even after the betrayal in Yalta, and after various such moments, it never happened that a Polish unit would rebel against the Allies. There was no acts of disloyalty, maybe there were some absence without leave, some deserters, marauders, that happens in every army. But these troops were the troops of extreme level of discipline. Very often, 
they were included in major extensive structures so that they became parts of the huge war machine and yet commanders like Sosabowski, Anders and Maciek made sure that remaining loyal and carrying out the joint ideas for campaigns, battles of all the allies, they tried to make sure not to lose the Polish interests so as not to bleed the Polish units too much and to work so that the Polish effort were was visible. Many tasks were uh, accepted just for that reason, to prove that we are a value our ally, it's worthwhile to have Poles on your side. Everyone hoped that these efforts, all that hardship and this devotion to the shared case will be translated into political results. So Poland as an ally will be um, appreciated that this will translate into the situation of Poland, that Poland won't be betrayed, that allies will also care for Poland's interests. And this also has to be said about the Polish troops. They never lost from their eyes the Polish raison d'etre. They made sure that their soldiers were properly cared for. You can see it best here. Those who served under Sosabowski and Matryk became a kind of order, faithful to the end of their lives, to their commanders and admiring them to the ends of their lives. They were magnificent officers. Other armies could just envy those. And it is perhaps the reason why they cared so much about the Polish matters that they did not receive British uh, retirement pensions, because perhaps if they, like Sosabowski was proposed, they accepted service in the British Army, their situation in the old age would have been absolutely different. So then there is this moral trait also of that generation who were still honed at the time of fight for independence. That was extremely significant. So this is just a short outline of those figures. This is just a short wrap up. I would like to say that those figures, well, the generals really pass their test uh, with flying colors. The following generations, for various reasons, did not behave properly. They failed. We are a generation that can make up for it, and we are trying hard to, we hope that what we are doing today serves it, that the assessment of what we did, of what the generals did, well, what they did were the deeds. Now we can uh, follow upon their actions, what they have achieved for the promotion of Polish raison d'etre culture, and we're trying to have that at the highest possible level. We are far from the flying colors. However, we're trying to do it, but I believe that these are seeds. These are the seeds that were sown by them long time ago in the interest of Poland, then they did not bring the fruition they expected, but perhaps thanks to the future activities, we should go on, we should cherish those uh, flowers so that their effort were not wasted, so that this could come to fruition also today, and perhaps this could be a good concluding statement for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this interesting lecture, especially interesting where the, at least for me, 
te the biographical parallels in the lives of our heroes that first the two generals are peers born in the same year but they went through a very similar obviously uh, proportions however very similar elements of their biography even before the polish state was developed um that was fighting for its independence then service in the army after the first world war then the lives after 39 and then being part of the Polish armed forces in the West, and then probably the most sorrowful age in this history, when we consider the lack of gratitude for such a beautiful biography, lack of gratitude in Poland dominated by communists and also abroad were Sosabowski and Maciek's soldiers did not receive their due uh, honors and respect from those they fought for. All I can say is that Mr. Marker very rightly and aptly emphasized that we are obliged to commemorate those beautiful pages in the history connected to the achievements and services of Maciek and Sosabowski. This is something that the Foundation is trying to achieve through, for example, such events as the one we're participating in today. But even before the pandemic in 2019, we managed to organize a beautiful bus rally in the footsteps of the soldiers of General Sosabowski and Maciek. It really was uh, very, very lively participated in. Mr. Uh, Markel, uh, Market sorry, was our guide, and those people had an opportunity to touch the places our tale today speaks of. So also in the context of of commemorating those places in the activity of Sosabowski and Maciek, though trying to, to, to make up for different failures, especially of the British, as you said it during your lecture, the Dutch really did their homework later and provided a dignified commemoration of our heroes. The Brits still have something lagging behind, but then in 2019, the group of the foundation participants of our uh, motorcade were also witnesses of the presence of then still um, the Prince of Wales, Charles Prince of Wales, at that place. So that was really telling that the British delegation really felt that they should pay proper homage. We received several questions during your lecture. I've got them written down here. So I I will let myself read them out so as not to overburden you with them. I will ask them successively, asking for replies depending on questions shorter or perhaps more extensive after every question. The first of the questions concerns, I believe it's a short one, about sources of knowledge about our heroes. You mentioned one video, but could you perhaps suggest some good biographies, monographic works, and other works on the lives of our heroes and the events they participated in? That's the first question that we have. General Sosabowski, General Sosabowski, the sources. A lot of archival materials have survived in Sikorsky's Institute, and this is what historians have been relying on. Trzeba powiedzieć, że akurat biografii takich prac biograficznych jest mniej i 
There aren't too many biographical works on General Sosabowski. I'm really happy that I have been able to work on that. I'm also working on an album publication. I have written his biography. However, it has been published, uh, but it has been distributed quite narrowly. So I would like it to become more available in the market. Moving on to General Maczek, there are a number of works. I do not mean just him as a person, but also the units that he commanded. Julius Tim wrote extensively about him and his units. He works at a higher war college in Lombardów. Jerzy Majka has also published on Maczek. One more thing. We have talked about two journals here, and both of them have written memoirs, and they should be highly recommended. If you are interested in any of these two men, do by all means read his works. They were both excellent writers. When you read their works, you can learn a lot about them as people, and an anecdote here for you. I have received a copy of Sosabowski's memoirs, and it had been writ read rather before me by an editor, and there you could read the editor's comments, no, this is more Russian than Polish, this one should be changed, that amended, and so on and so forth. General Sosabowski had this, well, special melody in his Polish that sounded quite Eastern. But, you know, these were actual people made of flesh and blood, not statues or monuments. Thank you so very much for that. There is another question that relates to what you've just said. General Sosabowski, has he ever explained why Operation Market Garden failed tactically? Did he ever explain it? Did he have a theory on that? Yes, indeed. He was quite straightforward about it. He said that it was a mistake on the part of the planners. He said it had been badly planned, this operation. There is this book that I would like to mention here. It has not been published in Poland, but hopefully it is going to be released this year. It has been published in the UK. It's been written by a Pole, but in English. Marek Savitsky. So a Polish person wrote in English and I have translated it. Dług nie honorowy is the Polish title, I believe. And it tells you about how people fought for the journal's good name. Now, the optics is quite interesting. There are a number of new materials, that is, they are new from the British point of view. And the assessment is quite objective. Basically, it is how the British operated, how they were taking decisions, and they used a special model to assess this operation, and the model has economics roots. By the way, it is not flattering for the British, to say the least, this work. So when you look at Sosabowski's decision and you juxtapose him with this work, you see that his work, his involvement, was indeed um, of high quality.
Niezrozumienie, is to be praised. Basically, those people didn't understand how to use paratroopers. It was a major error in doctrine. It was not a minor glitch. It is not that the timing was somewhat miscalculated. Basically, the decisions were catastrophic and this criticism is quite, quite crushing. Thank you very much for that. And another question. How do you see how General Sabotsky was presented in A Bridge Too Far in this film? Well, I would say the following. Gene Hackman was very well cast indeed. I know of one person who would be better. It is his great-grandson, Hal Sosabowski. He's a professor. Recently, he has become quite involved he has been sharing stories about his ancestor but gene was very well cast very well cast indeed in london's archives i found documents and it turned out that the polish veterans would be consulted the director would not always actually follow the veterans advice and you can see it in the final cut. Now, the team did consult on these things. It must be said. There is this anecdote, but I did not find any confirmation the Polish sources. So he's looking at the Polish, or rather the English officer, aviation officer, and he is saying, I'm not sure which side you are on. On, and that is why I'm, I'm looking at you so closely. Sounds very cinematic, this scene. I found a review written in the 70s by the British. It reads that Sosobowski was the only sane person in a house full of madmen. So, yes, his his uh, well uh, he was presented quite well but it was still not complete and you can see it in certain details because the Poles would fight on the northern bank of the river but basically his person was quite well represented. I wish all the Poles were similarly represented in various Western films. Another question. What about Sosabowski's relationship with his sons and how did his first son die? It is a difficult question. Sosabowski was a difficult person to live with. Now, what I'm going to say has not been confirmed in the sources, but there are two versions, two explanations for his son's death. Version number one was that he committed suicide, and the cause was his conflict with his father. That was the root cause. The second one, the second explanation, is that it was an accident involving a firearm. It's difficult to say, actually. A historian, historian needs to basically have those lines in the sand. And let me say that Sosadowski, it's quite clear, was not an easy person to live and deal with. There are certain things that maybe should not be revealed that are highly personal, intimate. 
But his relationship with his second son was very difficult indeed. The son lost his sight in the war surprising. And Sosabowski helped his son to emigrate to the UK. They were in touch and they would fight mostly about history because his son was in the home army and he fought in the uprising while his his, while Sosabowski the Elder was in the West, and there is this anecdote, allegedly the following happened. Basically, the junior said, I killed personally more people than you and your whole brigade, and they, and Sosabowski the Elder broke contact upon hearing that because there were quite hardy people mind you his career was quite beautiful and that is all what i wanted to say mind you Sosabowski the junior uh, in his capacity as a home army soldier would be an executioner and that is why he said what he said I'm looking at the list to see if there are any more questions, but it seems that that's it. No more questions. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. The lecture has been very interesting indeed. Quite smart, this juxtaposition of these two great figures. Two people connected by their service in the West. What connected with me was what you said about those generals, because you said that they were not only directly involved in military service in the West, but also what you've said is that they have been fighting for the Polish cause on this international stage. They wanted to make sure that the Polish soldiers would not lose their lives unnecessarily because they wanted to preserve the Polish forces. They wanted the generals, that is, to fight for the Polish cause so that it would reverberate abroad. Basically, they have been thinking about the Polish cause in general, and thus they served the Polish raison d'etat. And there is this phrase that you can read in Warsaw at the monument dedicated to Maciek, and there it reads, a Polish soldier fights for all nations, but he dies only for Poland. Thank you very much. Wojciech Market has been our guest. He's been our guest under our project, The Seeds of History is the name of the project. Thank you very much indeed to all those who have been following this meeting. And now let me give the floor to Veronika gawinska Brulikis, our colleague from the Janusz Kurtyka Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation in this event. Do listen to the talks that you can find on YouTube. Block, pressed, and our foundation I put them together. They are available in a number of language versions. Thank you so very much once again, and see you later. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Goodbye.